Please welcome Ambassador Sergei Kislytsia. <laughs> Ambassador, welcome to The Daily Show. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You have a really position, uh, a really interesting position and a, and a difficult undertaking right now because you are representing Ukraine at the UN and Ukraine is in one of the most precarious positions right now. Before we get into where we are, let's maybe clear up the beginning. How did this start and what is the cause of what we're seeing in Ukraine? Well, do you want a long story or you want a short version? <laughs> I guess we're on TV, well, the long so the short one version. is like 300, 300 years. But the, long, the short one is uh, Putin came to power and uh, he probably promised himself that he would restore the Soviet empire. And ever since, uh, we are um, in the state of war. And now we are in the state of hot war. I mean, actually, the war started not on the 24th of February. It started uh, back in... 2014. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you're in a position now where, as you said, I, li I like that you call it a hot war because it's a war that, you know, people can see very clearly. There, there are many people who are being killed. There are tanks rolling in. It's, it's, a, it's a different type of war, though, because everybody agrees that Ukraine is in the right. Everybody agrees that Russia is doing something wrong. And yet, because of Russia being Russia, it seems like the United Nations and many other countries are scared to overact for fear of causing a world war. How, how do you then ask for help? And, and what, do you, what do you hope will be achieved if countries, you know, have to balance this precarious position? Well, I think that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for me, we are already in the Third World War, which may be kind of crazy to say, but uh, the 21st century is not the 20th century where we had these standard wars with tanks uh, crossing the borders. Uh, we are in a hybrid world, and you don't really need to cross the border to attack uh, the United States. You can do that in the cyberspace, you know, or you can do like a terrorism or financial terrorism. So basically, um, we are there in the United Nations and the United Nations is a product of uh, three old gentlemen among uh, which was Joseph Stalin. So it's not perfect. And we still, uh, in the hundredth day of the war, we still have Russia sitting in front of us and we still pretend that we have to uh, respect it. And the only reason we respect Russian Federation is because, uh, well, I do not respect, but they have to respect. Uh, the, 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 yeah, that, that, that's a very important correction. Because they, they, they possess the nuclear arsenal, and they are really paranoid that Russia may use uh, nukes against them. So is, is your argument then that Russia shouldn't be sitting as one of those permanent members of the UN? Oh, first of all, Russia is not a permanent member, if you ask me. I mean, Russia occupied the seat of the Soviet Union back in 1991, the same way the Russia occupied Georgia, the same way Russia occupied uh, Transnistria in Moldova, the same way Russia invaded uh, uh, Syria. So uh, Russia occupies, 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 and we are all complacent with that. I mean, we were complacent with that until uh, the night of the 23rd, and all of a sudden we were surprised that it happened. I mean, which was imminent for 30 years. But do you, do you think that maybe this has been you know, it, 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 everything in hindsight is 2020. You know, and, and, and I've read, you know, some historians who would argue that, you know, there could have been a way for the world to bring Russia into the fold from the very beginning. Some say the problem was the fact that Russia was pushed out. Russia felt like they were being isolated. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. felt like NATO was encroaching on their territory. If Putin was brought into the fold, he would have had a vested interest in being part of the world. Do you, do, do you see any credence in that argument? Well, you know, I saw many Kremlinologists, or Sovietologists, as uh, they, call, they are called often, and they are tunneled with their vision of the world the same way like Germany was tunneled with Nord Stream, uh, you know. They saw the world through the tunnel of Nord Stream. And uh, we were, all of us, we are, uh, were guilty of uh, uh, letting Putin uh, grow as a dictator mm -hmm. uh, of uh, unprecedented scale in Europe. Um, probably Hitler was only the one we can compare him with. Uh, no, I don't believe in appeasement. I believe in the need to fight the virus. And uh, Russian uh, Putinism is the same as COVID, but it's only the in international politics COVID, you know. Right, right. And, 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 and it, it is taking its toll as well. You know, your, your, your country's in a position now where every day we read about how Russia is, is, is changing its tactics. You know, it's slowly becoming a war of attrition as opposed to a direct assault. You know, Ukraine has inspired the world in how, in how you're fighting back. You know, your, your president has been there staying in the country, you, you know, despite what everyone thought he would do. Um, 
when you get to the point, though, where it feels like European nations are almost encouraging Ukraine to, in some way, you know, give up a piece of territory. You see many European nations saying, Ukraine, maybe you should just give them the Donbas region, just give them that part that has already expressed some sort of interest in becoming part of Russia. You have said that that is a complete non-starter. Why? Yeah, it's absolutely. I mean, uh, I, unless everybody is amnesiac, you know, uh, let me remind it what happened in 1938 when Hitler signed uh, a Munich agreement with uh, Chamberlain. The New York Times literally, literally ran an article, uh, and I can quote from it, the world has never been pregnant with hope as it is now. And then oh. what happened? Czechoslovakia lost one-fifth of its territory. The Nazi troops moved in. And then in less than 12 months, the Second World War started, and the whole Czechoslovakia was invaded. So basically, if people are not very cognizant of the history lessons, they have to go back to schools, I think. And uh, it's a duty of all of us to make them study the history. Are you worried that European countries may at some point say, this is too much for us and we, we don't know if we're gonna back Ukraine through this? Because we've seen, again, through history, Russia is not afraid to fight long, painful wars. You know, it seems like Vladimir Putin's not afraid to, to send his troops out onto the front lines and, and, and have them perish because he doesn't have to worry about an election that he's losing. You know, and approval is not his issue. And so if, if you're in that position, you know, Ukraine is in, is in a space where you have your, 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 your people who may get de demoralized, you know, you have a nation that is constantly bombarded, you know, obviously the US is helping you, but, but what would you hope the next steps would be then? Where do you see the world moving towards to well, help Ukraine? Well, Trevor, you just came from Europe, uh, aren't you, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, you see, you saw it with your own eyes that Europe is not really homogeneous. Uh, it is so diverse, it's like a bouquet of nations. Right. So it would be kind of uh, over generalization to say that Europe believes, Europe says. I mean, we have wonderful, wonderful nations uh, like Poland, like the UK, uh, like uh, Portugal, I just uh, talked to the Portuguese ambassador, like uh, Baltic states. They will fight hard until the very end to defeat the Russian despotism. You know, we have some countries that got used to live in comfort for so long mm -hmm. that they are out of context altogether. Oh. But the thing is that if we do not defeat Putinism today, right? If we, we will be satisfied with just a military defeat of Russia in Ukraine, and we will uh, let this dictator to regrow his chopped back claws, they will hit all of you again, like in five or seven years from now, and then we all pay triple price for it. So even from the point of view of uh, investing money in Ukrainian uh, victory. Investing money in Ukrainian victory is investing money in your own security. And you should be all grateful that it is the Ukrainian soldiers, not the British soldiers, not the American soldiers, who are dying in the front, defending the collective democratic world, you know. So I have to remind about that to all uh, of our viewers and to all people in Europe, in North America, and not only there. I have to remind all Africans who will suffer from the food shortages in two months from now. A lot of people don't know about that. You know, I, I, I saw many people complaining about food prices going up. Many people in the Middle East and Africa struggling with, um, you know, a shortage of wheat and bread is, you know, exactly. one of the most important food sources. Uh, many people don't know how much of that grain is coming from Ukraine for the entire world. There are countries, there are countries that are 70% dependent on Ukrainian grain. And those countries are devastated with civil wars, or with droughts or with uh, uh, climate calamities, they have no way to go on the market and buy grain from somewhere else. So, I mean, from the, for them, it is a matter of survival. And the fact is that we have 21 million tons of grain sitting to be exported. Right. And we can't do that because one crazy little person in, in Kremlin does not really allow us to do that, you know? And that's, uh, that's amazing. I mean, that's amazing. And uh, one of the jobs uh, we have to do, one of the things we, we are doing currently in the United Nations, we are desperately seeking the way how to save millions of people who are literally under the threat of dying of starvation 10,000 miles away from, from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. you know, and that is why this conflict has so many implications that unlike in 2014, where we, when we were all happy 
to have 100 nations voting uh, in favor of the territorial integrity of Ukraine, we now have overwhelming majority. We have 141 nations that voted on the 2nd of March and that identify Russia as an aggressor state. You know, there were only four countries, such wonderful countries as North Korea and Syria, who voted in support of, of Russia. You know, and it's very important. It's very important because the world finally understood that it's not just about Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's about the entire collective democratic community of nations. Thank you so much for joining us, Ambassador. Thank you for inviting. I appreciate the time. Hopefully we'll see you again.